Hi guys, <laughs> finally able to uh, do this video. I was supposed to be doing this live stream, but as usual, all of my network just decided to trip on me. Anyway, I just want to get into it quickly. I want to continue with my teaching that I did two, that was two days ago, two days ago, in regard to uh, the dreams that two of my followers had sent in to me, uh, in regards to what does it mean when you have dreams uh, with animals and dreams of strange creatures or even strange people uh, strange people in terms of look like aliens or monsters and stuff coming at you in the dream or even just your stationary in the dream or just observing you or even attacking somebody else do these things have spiritual significance well yes they do and my job today is to come off of the heels of what we did two days ago and to take you even deeper into the scriptures that will give more spiritual insights on these particular things so let me just recap what I did uh, a few days ago what I talked to you about again what does it mean when I have a dream and in that dream I'm seeing animals insects creatures or what have you or even strange creatures aliens or whatever the case may be what is the significance of that I said to you in that particular video that what it would indicate is they represent evil spirits for the most part and again it all depends on the dream but remember this teaching is based on negative dreams okay now the reason why I'm making that clear jumping out of the box is because uh, people say all the time why are you always talking about negative dreams because 99% of people have negative dreams on a consistent basis so I'm telling you what they mean so that you will be able to be proactive in dealing with them that's the reason why I talk about it all right second of all I used in uh, two days ago uh, Ezekiel 37 verses 1 to 14 and I gave you a comparison or a format sorry or a platform in which we're going to be using from the scriptures to make sense of these dreams we talked about Ezekiel when the hand of God took him into the spiritual world we made it very clear that when it said the hand of God God being a spirit took Ezekiel by the spirit into the spiritual world he didn't take Ezekiel's physical body with him we had to have made that clear because we needed to understand or have a good visual mentally of what this particular scripture is saying because this scripture now becomes the foundation the basis of where we're headed with this particular teaching he said the hand of the Lord took him into this valley of dry bones and sat him down all right then the Lord took him round about these bones so he'll have a good view of it. And he questioned Ezekiel, asking him, Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? Ezekiel in turn said, well, Lord, you know. God said to him, okay, well, now you prophesy to the bones and all of a sudden flesh and strength and stuff begin to come on the bones. Long story short, the bones basically became humans. They were, uh, I guess, resurrected, for lack of a better word. And they became this mighty army God said I think it's in verse 40 of Ezekiel 37 he now began to reveal the mystery and God said to Ezekiel this right here whom you've just prophesied to as instructed by me well this is the house of Israel so what does this all mean what this really mean is what I've been teaching you all along God took this guy behind the scenes of the physical world and began to show him the components or the root causes of why these people were acting in this particular way it wasn't because they had a stomach virus or whatever the case may you may label it as physically but God was showing him which is what which is what I'm always trying to get you to do look at the spiritual components what what are the spiritual factors pulling the strings from the unseen world or the invisible world that is giving us this result in the physical world take that same format now and we bring it back to these dreams where you're having uh, dreams of animals in the dream and what it's really showing the animals are really spirits evil spirits though that they're wicked spirits coming to 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 do things listen to me listen carefully not physically to your life but spiritually they don't need to do it physically because once they would have made the alteration spiritually then automatic physically those things would run its course unended if there is no intervention opposition or resistance by the victim the dreamer or whomever the dreamer is dreaming about that the dreamer is pointing to giving some form of some form of spiritual insight okay so we're going to pick it up from there and like I said I'm going to give you more details and uh, as to what we 
going to talk about during this uh, particular dream, okay? Okay. So, our first scripture today, let me just turn this up, you still have a better view. Okay, our first scripture today, let me just rest this right here, would be Genesis chapter 3. Let me turn this over here. Genesis chapter 3. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Because we want more insight. Kevin, what does it mean? I had a dream last night, Kevin, and I saw a kangaroo in my dream. I saw a giraffe. I saw a dog, which is a very common dream. A lot of dogs coming behind me, biting me, trying to do vile things to me. Some dogs even talking to me. Kevin, what does this mean? So <clears throat> I'm going to give you... I'm going to make this short, but it's going to be very, very deep. Okay? Because the, you're taking it again from the spiritual realm. You cannot make any understanding of what's physically happening, happening unless you understand the spiritual components involved that's causing the uh, physical things to happen. All right? So let's look at Genesis uh, chapter 1. Genesis chapter 3, sorry. Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to read verse 1. Okay? We're trying to make some sense here now. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And now listen to what it says. Now the what? what? What was that word? Now the who? The serpent. I want you to highlight that. I want you to circle that. All right? I want you to circle that. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, who's he? Who's he? And he said unto the woman, the serpent. And he said unto the woman, yea, had God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now who's this serpent though? Is this serpent a literal serpent? Or is this serpent being used to, uh, as a symbol of something else? Well, I submit to you both. And we are going to see that in a little bit. But let's read it again. Now the serpent was more subtle. Because as you can see here, the serpent is actually... The serpent, for those of you who don't know, is a snake. <laughs> so the serpent here is actually having a conversation with a human, which would have been Eve. And the, the serpent asks her a question. It says, and he... There's a second sentence in this particular verse. And he, or the serpent, said unto the woman, which would have been Eve, yea, had God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Is, this, is the serpent just a serpent, or is the serpent a spirit? Well, the truth is, the serpent is a spirit. The serpent, I submit to you, is Satan. Now, does that mean it wasn't a live, living serpent? No, it doesn't mean that. It, in fact, there was a live living serpent that the enemy, the spirit of Satan, inhabited the body of that particular certain serpent. It used that body of the serpent. Now, isn't that interesting? Some of you may say, well, that's not possible. But you can't say that because we, we read a story some time back where the spirits again, uh, these legions of spirits, negotiated with Jesus to not cast them just arbitrarily anywhere out of the human host they were inhabiting at the time. They specifically said, cast us into the swines. All right? So I'm just giving you some little insights so you get a better visual of what's happening here. The serpent is now having a conversation, but in this teaching, because I want to prove to you that the animals, the creatures, the strange UFO, alien-looking stuff that you see in the dreams are actually spirits, okay? So... As you can see, it says that the serpent, which is literally a snake, there's no doubt about it, it was a snake, that was speaking to Eve. But the spirit behind that snake was Satan himself. And we're going to prove this, okay? Because again, we want to prove that the animals, the creatures, the insects, whatever that we see in our dreams, are in fact spirits. They don't necessarily all the time mean that they are evil spirit, but this teaching is specifically talking about evil spirits. The day will come and I will teach on dreams which will signify that. But the truth is I don't because you can take these same principles and convert the ones that will have a positive meaning. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and we're going to look at verse 2. Because all we're trying to do here now is to prove to you that the serpent in the dream, sorry not in the dream, but whom Eve had the experience was it was a literal snake but there was a spirit behind the snake. Revelation chapter 20 verse 2 says, And he laid hold on the dragon, okay, 
that old serpent, okay, because he's two in the same, which is, who is it? Who's, who's the serpent again? Who's the dragon? Which is the devil. That's what it says here. The devil and Satan, that's what I'm reading here. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent. So who's this old serpent? Who's this, this dragon? He says, the devil and Satan. You see that? So the scripture is now revealing to you that the serpent in the scriptures is referring to Satan, the devil. So if you have a dream, if you have a vision, and you see this snake trying to bite you or even bit, bit you, you're dealing with the Satan or the devil. Or, well, let's make it general, evil spirits. When that serpent bites you, I would have bitten you in the dream, and this is why you need to know what they represent. What do serpents do? Serpents inject from their fangs venom. But remember now, because this is a dream, yourself or another human that you're dreaming about, that is the spiritual aspect of that person. So when that serpent bite into you or the person that you're dreaming about, it's a spiritual being, which is the devil, injecting or biting your spirit. And just like in the natural, when a physical snake bites you, it literally deposits venom in your bloodstream. It is the exact same thing in the spiritual realm, but the only difference is here is a spiritual being is penetrating your spiritual body, which we refer to a couple of weeks ago as your celestial body, and is injecting evil to corrupt you, to change you from the original. So this now says to you, it's not just a dream. It's not just some fantasy you're having in your mind, okay? The, the spiritual implications of these things are far more reaching to the point that it can be detrimental to your physical being and to remove you from the earth altogether if you do not understand the spiritual components. So as we can see here so far, the scripture has now made it clear to us that the serpent is in fact Satan, or as we refer to as the devil. I want to show you another revelation. I want you to go to Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. I want to make this as very quick as possible. I know I promised you in my last video that I was going to take you to a beautiful background to do this. And I did. I actually did the video and everything. When I got home to download it, for some reason, the disc that I recorded it on, it broke or break the videos up in parts. I had like about five parts to one video. So I'm like, no man, I'm not gonna do that. Doing parts seven, eight, nine, and 10 for these short videos. So forget that. So I've corrected the problem, decided to do it here, but I will do an e a video this evening though, to wrap up this entire teaching out on the, and the view that I had the last time, I was so upset because it was so beautiful, but I'll do that this evening nevertheless. So let's go to Luke chapter 10 verse 19. So we're gonna see some deeper revelation as it relates to animals and creatures in the dream. Now remember, coming off of the heels here, we just discovered that the serpent that was identified in uh, Genesis chapter three, verse one, while it was a physical snake that actually spoke to her, the spirit in that snake, or that inhabited the body of that snake was in fact uh, uh, Satan. Now there's a lot more I could teach on that as it relates to why he had to actually use a body, but it's gonna take us into something that is kind of I mean, it relates to this, but it's, it's much deeper in terms of being legally tired to operate in the right. He must have a body, but I'm not going to take you there today, all right? In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, very powerful. And it says, Behold, who's speaking here? Jesus, it's very clear that we know who's speaking. Behold, I have given you, or behold, I give, I give unto you power. This is Jesus now unto you power to thread on serpents and scorpions. Now remember I used the scripture in our last teaching. Jesus is telling his disciples, well actually the 70, the 70 disciples that he had commissioned, this was aside from the 12 disciples. But you know what, let's take it from verse 17, because it can make more sense. In verse 17 of Luke 10 it says, and the 70 returned again with joy. Returned to who? They returned to Jesus, who had commissioned them earlier. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils, circle that word. See, don't let's pass these things because these are spiritual nuggets. It says, and the 70 returned again with joy, 
which was unto Jesus, they returned to Jesus saying, Lord, even the spiritual beings, evil ones are this, that's what devils are, you cannot see them. Even these spiritual beings, which are the devils, are subject unto us, but this is powerful, through your name. Remember I talked about this. Jesus, this is so, <laughs> I get so excited about this because the more you understand spiritual law, spiritual rules, spiritual protocol, spiritual precepts, ordinance, commands, and, 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 and principles, I'm telling you, the, the more your, 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 your strength in, in your limbs becomes stronger because the more knowledge you understand of how you're positioned in the spiritual realm based on the authority given to you, not just by words, by actual spiritual uh, power when we engage the spiritual world through the laws and the rules when we follow them, but you're an unstoppable force. <laughs> so it says, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. He, they're saying, Lord, when we went out there to, to proclaim your name to them and tell them about the Christ and to, to get it right with God, when the devils came up against us, the invisible forces operating through people or speaking through people in these strange voices, it says, when we said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, they were subject, they humbled themselves before us. Wow, isn't that powerful? Stick a pin there because we're going to come back there. And he said unto them, who is he? Said unto who? Jesus said unto the 70. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Meaning that this really ain't no big deal what y'all talking to me, but I've seen greater. Verse uh, 19 says, behold, this is where it now comes together. Behold, I give unto you power to thread on serpents and scorpions. What is this power that he's given us? Well, they said what the power was in verse 17. And the power was the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I love this. Yeah, God, I, I love this. I love this so much. Behold, I've given unto you power. Behold, I've given unto you my name. I've given you the authority to use my name, Kevin. Kevin, listen, when you're having dreams about animals coming at you to harass you, bite you, attack you, kill you, Kevin, you, and I know this because I've, it has happened to me on a number of occasions. And even in my dream, I'm sure you have done the same thing. And you said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, or in the name of Jesus. And either you woke up with the dream, or that thing disappeared, or that thing was disabled, or you saw chains come on it, or something pull it back from coming at you. I've had a vision of that before where my eyes were open and this lady was coming at me with a sword dress in some Roman uh, attire, soldier's art attire, and I, in the name of Jesus Christ, and it disappeared. So the power here is in some super strength you have physically. The power is the authority of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Anyway, we're going to get back there again. So it says, Behold, I've given you power to thread or to walk. Now this is where it's going to get deep now. Behold, I've given you power to thread or to walk on what? You've given me power, but did it say I've given you power or I've given you the authority of my name to thread or to walk upon Kevin? No, Mary. No, Tom. No, my boss who's being unfair to me. No, my wife who don't respect me or your husband who speaks to you. No. And the revelation of the scripture, he says, I'm giving you the power to subdue spirits. But he's identifying the spirits here, not as people, but as creatures. Now, isn't that interesting? Listen to what he says here. Behold, I give unto you power to thread on serpents and scorpions. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, isn't, that, isn't that awesome? We read this over and over. We read this over and over. And surely he is not saying to you, I, I have come... Uh, to reconcile you with God from heaven and to become a sacrifice for you so that you will have power over insects and little creatures. Now, does that make any sense to you? No. But it's going back to the two the questions that was given to me, my followers. The reason why you're dreaming about these animals or creatures in your dreams, they represent spirits. And for the most part, I'm sure they're negative dreams, so it represents evil spirits. What are they doing? Who are they attacking? What are they saying? All of these things you need to know now because now, based on the study of the scriptures, we are able to expose who they really are. Yes. 
Isn't that powerful? So he, did, he didn't say, I've given you. He says, listen, I have given you power. I have given you the authority to use my name, not on people, not over people. You don't say in the name of Jesus, get away from me, Kevin. And he demonstrated this. He demonstrated this in, in Peter, I think it was, who, who, who came. Uh, I forget what the situation was about. And he looked at Peter and he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan. Now, if we were there, because he was pointing at Peter, you would think he was speaking to the human being, Peter. But he was speaking to the spirit, the devil, that was using Peter to utter some nonsense. And Christ checked this. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. But of course, we know that Peter was not Satan. Satan. So this scripture now is now giving us empirical evidence that just how he demonstrated that with the situation with Peter, he says, now I'm giving you this, the power. I'm giving you power not to come against people, not to come against human beings, even though they're the ones attacking you, even though they're the ones coming at you physically. But Jesus Christ in his superb, I mean, wisdom, is trying to impute this wisdom to his people or those that will follow him and say, man, listen, you have a power residing in you as a believer of Jesus Christ that is greater than any, any human power because this power is the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to subdue in the spiritual realm that which was attacking, harassing, coming at you physically. Now, isn't it just so powerful because he's making it clear I'm not giving you power to come against people. That's why I didn't call people's name. I didn't say I'm giving you power to come against uh, whomever physically is a, is a threat to you, has been harassing you, has been lying on you. And that's why I, he's saying I don't want you to ever pray against these people. I'm th if you would follow this rule, you would be much more successful. The scripture makes it very clear. So he says, we all have given you power or the authority to use my name to thread or to walk upon serpents and scorpions. And we know serpents to be what? The devil, Satan himself. That's what he represents. I didn't want to do this, but I got to do this. I'm going to be very brief on it. He said, I've given you power or authority to use his name to thread upon serpents and scorpions. Now, we know serpents and scorpions are not, are not literal in the sense but they represent spirits, evil spirits. But I want you to look at the order in which this is said. He said serpents and he said scorpion. All right? That's what he said, right? Serpent will represent the highest order of spiritual evil. And that's why I say to people all the time, if you're having a dreams where it's always filled with snakes, especially when you see pythons and bow constrictors and deadly snakes and so on, you're dealing with a, the, the, a, the, a very high level of spiritual attack. And that's why the snake was mentioned first. I'm sure most of you know about the biblical rule of uh, the law of first mention, the way that it is mentioned in the Bible. That's the order it will flow in. Okay, so serpents here, he said, people have given you power to thread over serpents. So he's telling you the highest order of the kingdom of darkness. I'm, when you use my name, it have to sub, subject itself to it. Then he used the word scorpion. Scorpion in and of itself, I mean, I could really take you into a whole line of revelation. With that. But like I said, I don't have the time to do it right now, but I will cover that one day. But what it's basically saying here is speaking about tormenting spirits or lesser spirits. When you are stung by a scorpion, you cannot just uh, put some ointment on it and the pain, the sting, even though the ointment or whatever will heal it or is healing it, the sting remains constant. So it's speaking about torment. So basically when he says, I've given you power over serpents and scorpions, what he's saying is, I've given you power from the highest in the kingdom of darkness all the way down to the lesser devils to the tormenting ones. But my name will shut all of them down. That's what he's saying. So he says, Behold, I have given you power to thread on serpents and scorpions. Now watch what he says next. And all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by no means hurt you. I got to kind of step back just a little bit to make something clear here. 
a lot of times you would hear me in my teaching, right? And I talk about, you know, people always say, well, you know, uh, especially preachers, uh, God said to put on this, you know, he brought these vial of oils. If anyone purchase it from him and rub it on them, they'll be whatever. Or they want you to buy a miracle cloth or miracle shawl or, or blow the shofar and all these other things. And again, I want to be clear here. I'm not throwing shade at anyone. I'm not trying to disparage those who use these things. Here is what I am saying, though. These things cannot supplement the scripture right here. Here is why I'm saying that. Be all I've given unto you the shofar. You didn't read that. Behold, I've given unto you the vials of oil. You didn't read that. Behold, I've given unto you a miracle cloth. You didn't read that. You didn't read that, right? Now, is that to say that these things uh, cannot, God cannot use to perform miracles? No, I'm not saying that. Like I always say in my videos, a lot of people misinterpret what I say because they want to be malicious. But what I am saying is that whenever these things uh uh, replace the name of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, then you have a problem. There's a particular preacher on television who's constantly talking about miracles. I'm not going to call his name. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And he always has his broadcast where he feel an audience giving testimonies that they bought this particular vial of water from him from the Russian Springs or whatever. And they would give these testimonies that one lady I remember watching, she said her daughter was given a lot of problems and one day she's washing her daughter clothes and she took the vial of water and she poured it into the washing machine and ever since that day her daughter was back on track. Now to be totally honest with you, to me that's sorcery, that's witchcraft. Here is why. The more you watch that program, Jesus is only tied on the tail end to attract people as this is the headliner. But truly, when you come here, after this headliner, meaning the name Jesus, there's nothing here about him. Everything is about man's wisdom, man's power, man's gratification, and so on. So when you get into those places, they're selling you these little cloths. They're selling you little vials of oil. They're selling you. And what they're really doing is very subliminal. They're replacing the word of God with these things. So they're saying to you, let's take a shortcut. You don't have to take in the Word of God. You don't have to get all that spiritual, you know. Don't mind Kevin, man. He's just too deep, man. He's too religious, you know. You don't have to follow the laws like he's saying, you know. And all you need to do is this this, this here. You don't get better than this. Take this vial of uh, water from the Russian springs and, and, and pour it over your husband's head in the nighttime and he will not cheat anymore. That is sorcery. That is witchcraft. Witchcraft in the sense that you're using an item which clearly has been a curse or some evil spoken over it to perform something that it was programmed to do. Nowhere in there you're hearing the scriptures. Nowhere he's saying, take this word, meditate on this word. Yeah, you could use this cloth. Yeah, you could use this file. Excuse me, but use it as a point of contact. Don't believe that this here is going to change the situation. Believe that the word of God and that he sent this cloth, that preacher, and you're holding on this as a point of contact. Like in your mind, you're visualizing that me holding this is like me and this preacher who's telling me to use it. Like we're joining our faith together. But the truth is, we are, we're standing on this word to bring about the miracle that we want. But when the, the word is removed and you're saying that you're taking this item from this preacher and that this item is going to change the situation, this is sorcery. You, this preacher is heavily into sorcery, heavily into sorcery. And of course, I'll do a teaching on that, probably after the teaching that I'm doing on my radio program every Saturday right now, which is Witchcraft Exposed. I might even add that in there, just to show you what to look out for to identify these people. So what I'm saying here overall is this. We're not, we're focusing on the representation, what does these animals represent? And so far, we realize that they represent spirits. In this case, this teaching, evil spirits. So Jesus says, Behold, I've given you power, the authority for you to use my name so that you will be able to thread over serpents and scorpions, thread over the greatest powers in the kingdom of darkness to the lesser tormenting spirits. And he says, And over all of the enemy, and listen to what he says next, next and nothing shall by no means hurt you. You hear what he's saying? Now, what is he saying here, really? He, Jesus is saying, listen, I cover in all ground. Let me show how powerful this 
power I'm giving you, which is the authority of my name when you use it. He says, from the greatest of the kingdom of darkness to the lesser in the kingdom of darkness and all, everything that the, the, the enemy can come up with, he says, listen, I have given you authority and power over that, but it's in my name. So what does this mean, Kevin? If someone is praying and they're not using in the name of Jesus, or some people might say, well, I use in the name of Yeshua or in the name of Yah, all in the same, all in the same. Some may say, well, Kevin, I know about the name of Jesus because you know, man, do this, listen to me. I ain't even going there with you. If that's what you believe, then you stick to what you believe. I know it worked for me. I know, and I'm not making a doctrine out of this. I'm saying to anyone out there, I will never challenge you on Yeshua. I believe in that. I will never challenge you on Jah or Yah. I believe in that. I believe in Jehovah uh, Jaira, I believe in the name Jehovah Elohim, all of that I believe in. I'm not going to make a doctrine or even an argument of what name you should use. I'm telling you, when I was attacked by spirits, evil forces, witchcraft that was projected at me, physically I would see it coming at me in visions and dreams. I, in the dream or in the vision, said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and it ceased, stop, or disappear. So again, I'm not throwing any shade. Yes, you could use Yahweh, Yah, uh, whatever other name to, to represent God, use them. But don't come over here and tell me what worked for me. Don't work when I see it work. Because it reminds me of Galatians 3 and 1, when Paul was so upset and he says, Oh foolish Galatians, who have been with you? You don't. You see what you was doing was working for you. Why you let somebody come in here and try to tell you something else? Again, I'm not throwing no shade on nobody. I'm not attacking nobody. None of that. I'm saying what worked for Kevin. Guess, guess what? You would have had experience with Yeshua name. You would have had experience with, with any other name. Okay? If, if, it, if it's doing what the scriptures say, the power of the name of Jesus Christ will do, my friend, go ahead with, with whatever it is. If the, if the Holy Spirit is convicting you otherwise, particularly go, go ahead with the Holy Spirit. But I'm not going to make an argument on that. I'm not going to run on with that. So he says, we all have given you power to thread upon serpents and scorpions. He's talking about creatures, animals. That's what he's talking about right now. But these creatures and animals are not literal. Just like throughout the whole scriptures, it's showing you or it's giving you a spiritual understanding of what is actually happening. So if you're, you're in a home, okay, and in this, you had a dream, and in this dream, you saw this huge crocodile in your living room. Now, of course, in reality, the crocodile is not there. But based on the teaching, now you have spiritual insight that, yes, that's true. No, I cannot see a crocodile in here. But the Lord is showing me through this dream, this spirit which the crocodile represents is in my home. And what does your home represent? Your life. If you're mad, it will represent your, your, your union. But more importantly, Bailey, so everybody here is going to be somebody somehow affected by this particular creature. The question here is now, what does this crocodile represent? Kevin, because I don't understand every dream. I don't know what crocodile mean. I don't know what uh, a sheep mean in the dream. I don't know that. You, you're right. You may not know that. But what do you do now? Like I always tell you, rather than waiting on Kevin all the time, because I am not your savior, I'm not your spiritual father, and I will not answer you if you call me that, okay? Because I don't believe in that. What I do believe in is that, see, I can only take you so far. If you really want change in your life, you will not make the commitment to go the rest of the way. So what do you do? You jump right on your computer. You go there to do everything else. You know what? Let me type in crocodile. Let me type in croc. I mean alligator. And what am I going to really look for to understand? Well, let's look. That, let's let's do some study on what they are like in their natural habitat. How do they feed? What are their characteristics when they hunt their prey? What is the specific things that they look for when it comes to feeding? These are the things that you're going to look for. Why? Because these characteristics. That's the reason why you saw that specific animal. These characteristics in this animal is exactly how the spiritual evil being behaves. That's the reason why you saw them in that form. It's as simple as that. Okay, so let's let's add more to this. Let's bring more light to this. So I could uh, bring more insight here to you. Let me just get this. Okay, all right. So let's go to Joel chapter 2. 
because we're going to see another example of this. Joel chapter 2, where are we now? Here we go, Joel chapter 2, and let's look at verse 25. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy this, man. I love revelation. I love understanding. And I, I pray, and I always pray this, you know, believe it or not, whether I'm praying it publicly or privately, every time I pray, I pray that God will give you the wisdom, the knowledge, the understand, understanding, the counsel and might and boldness to do what I do, but I want him to double yours. And I always tell you, I'm not in this for competition. I'm not in here trying to get points, get likes on Facebook, Twitter. I don't care about that. I genuinely, and you, you can see it in my passion, I genuine, genuinely want you to break that limitation in your life and go forward in what you're supposed to do and live a good life. And the only way that's going to happen is when you understand the spiritual world. So even now, God, I pray that those listening to me right now, that you would not only amplify their spirit of discernment, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, their spirit of might, meaning giving them the ability to break out of that spirit of procrastination and laziness and do what you have called them to do. Give them a hunger and an insatiable desire for the word and the things of God, that they will always be on a hunt for the knowledge of God. And God, I pray that would you have rest upon me in terms of your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and the ability to articulate your word that even a child can understand it, double it in their lives. Everyone listening to me right now, everyone that is eating up all of this spiritual understanding that I'm getting from the scripture, it is my prayer that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob will bless you and double upon you whatever it is that you admire in me in terms of the scripture, that he will exceed and, and, and your, your, your greatest desire of him in these things. That's how much I want you to succeed. Many people say, Kevin, how come you ain't writing no books yet? I'm, I'm, I, I have 10 books, I tell you right now, unpublished, unedited on my, on my hard drive right now. If I, wanna, I could write those books and, and live like a millionaire. I have more than enough people that follow me that I know would purchase the books, but that's not what I'm interested in right now. In fact, you go write books. I pray for the anointing right now that you will go ahead and write books. I'm not, God hasn't brought me to that point right now. The time is coming for that though. The time will come, but for right now, right now, based on what is going on in this world, in the churches, in the spiritual realm, against the believers, to shut them down, my job is to teach, my job is to inform, my job is not to try to charge you for every little thing about God. All I want you to do is better than me. I'm going to tell you what I told my son. I can get right back into this message. Uh, I told my son, I said, my son, I've educated you uh, from, took care of you from a child all throughout school. Uh, you've never went to a public school. You went to private school all your life. You went to college. You graduate. You get your bachelor's degree. I said, as your father, you owe me absolutely nothing. You, you did not ask me to come here. I brought you here. All right? Now, here's what I mean by that. While you don't owe me anything, because what I did, I was supposed to do for you because I brought you here, the only thing that you, I want from you, based on all of that I've done for you, I want you to treat your children far better than I treated you. That, they call it pay it forward. That's, that is my gift from you. Now, what is my gift from you to me? You know what I want from you? I want you to be better than me. Every good parent would want their children to excel or go beyond where they came to an end. And that's what I genuinely want. So as you can see, for me, this isn't about no money because I could be making millions right now. This isn't about no fame. That is gonna, that, that has come, that is automatically coming. So these are the things, and I'm saying this, especially for the young preachers, man. Focus on what God has called you to do. That's your focus. Focus on that. Don't let nobody change your narrative. A lot of people can come with some different spins and some new revelation. If they're not taking that from the scriptures and showing you ample support, resist these people. All right? So let's go to Joel chapter 2. I just want to shove that in there. Joel chapter 2. And again, we're still dealing with these animals that we see in the dream. What do they really represent? Do they mean the actual animals or do they represent something of a greater significance? Yes, they do represent something of a greater significance. Listen to what it says here, Joel chapter 2, verse 25. God is speaking now. And I love this scripture. God in his infinite wisdom is fully aware that more than 99.5% of us will not do what he has called us to do 
on the schedule that he has called us to complete it all. Many of us will be distracted. Many of us will be pulled aside by relationships, by greed, whatever. But this God is so awesome that he has also calculated in your tenure here a backup plan that when you mess up and you come to yourself, as we're about to read here, he's now going to restore you the time loss. I love this here, but watch this. Joel chapter 2 verse 25 says, and I will restore, this is God speaking, I will restore to you, listen now, the years that your boss took from you, I didn't read that, the years that you lost in that first marriage where you had a divorce and you had to start back from zero again, I didn't read that either. The years that they did you when you were uh, not, they never gave you the promotion when you're supposed to, no, I'm not reading that. Instead, what we're about to read here, he's saying he's going to restore unto us and he's going to reveal to us who were the ones stealing from us, but they were never people. In fact, he's going to list off a whole cadre of insects here. Let's get on. <laughs> Listen, powerful. Joel 2.25 says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten away, the canker worm, the caterpillar. Where, where were they? Because I remember my friend threw me under the bus. I remember a relative who was made sure something I was supposed to get I never got, I never knew about. I, I remember an inheritance or this or that happened. But God saying here that I will restore unto you and he's showing me the culprits who stole from me. He said a locust. I don't remember seeing any locust when the bank repossessed my complex. I don't remember that. I don't remember seeing any caterpillars or you know what? The last time I probably saw a caterpillar was when I was about uh, five or seven years old. <laughs> so where were these creatures when I was being delayed by a relationship I shouldn't have been in? Where were these creatures when I was being undermined and unfairly treated on a job? Where were these creatures when I was in all that trouble? Because as far as I'm concerned, the one who stole from me, the one who cheated me or took advantage of me, they were physical human beings. They were humans. And God is saying, no, 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 my friend. No, 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 my friend. That is where you've been going wrong. They were only the agents used by the, this locust and this palmer worm and this catapult that I'm talking about. Remember I told you, you know, these insects only represent spirits. Okay? And they were never, ever physically coming behind you. This is why you always have to look at the spiritual realm for the origin of your problem. The canker worm never came behind you physically, Kevin. The palmer worm never came behind you physically, Kevin, meaning they never came for Kevin. They were coming after Kevin's spirit. Why? Because because of his spirit, the Lord has put aside a cadre of spiritual blessings just for Kevin. And these spirits know that if they could eat away, steal, rob, hide, uh, misplace Kevin's spiritual blessings, according to Ephesians 1 and 3, which clearly states, Blessed be the Lord our God, who has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Verse 4 says he did this before the foundation of the world. So before God birthed Kevin from his mother, Margaret Bonaby, before he, God did that, God had already secured everything spiritually for Kevin to make him excel, to advance, to go forward in this physical life. But what the enemy does is he causes Kevin to focus on people. So Kevin think now the boss is coming behind him, his supervisor, his managing director, his president. When God says, no, 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 there is a spirit on that person using that person. It could be a locust, it could be a palmer worm spirit, whatever, but these are just the shape that they're taking on. But the truth is they're evil spirits. And they're coming to attack Kevin so that they could create a spirit of anger in Kevin or, or, or attack him with the spirit of anger to make him curse row neglect God rules and go do it his own way because the spirit knows that if he does it his own way he's going to secure destruction in the end how do I know this uh, Proverbs chapter 16 verse 25 there's a way unto us that may seem right but we are guaranteed that the end of that way is destruction another translation says even death so you see here these creatures that you're seeing are spirits 
So in this scripture, it says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten away. This is, these are the spirits that use human beings to eat away at your spiritual blessing, but they, they were doing it from the spiritual realm. So that locust and palmer worm, or oh, hold on, here's Kevin, Kevin wealth, here's Kevin health. We're going to eat away at that, but the manifestation of that comes now in the natural. Kevin eating bad, Kevin drinking liquor, smoking, destroying his body. We're going to eat away at Kevin's spiritual promotion. How is that now displaying in the physical realm? Then the enemy is going to use this boss. That same locust is going to now be resting upon this boss with a spirit of jealousy or whatever to ensure that Kevin never get promoted. Kevin never advance in life. So you're seeing the correlation here now with these insects that you're seeing in the dream or seeing in the vision that you're being privy to. Go and research what, what are they like in their natural habitats. How do they feed? How do they hunt? How do they behave? Because that is showing you firsthand how these particular spirits are eating away at your spiritual blessing because those spiritual blessing is what you have been given by God to fulfill your destiny, to fulfill what he has called you to do. These are the resources that you're going to glean from when you pray and asking God, God, I pray for boldness as I'm about to go and minister your word. I pray for spiritual insight. Then you're going to glean from your spiritual blessings that were already in place before the foundation of the world. But what is eating at it though? The locust, the palm over many other insects or animals and so on, but they're not coming after you. They're coming after those spiritual blessings because if those spiritual blessings are not in place, you have nothing to glean from spiritually to do what you are called to do. I hope you are getting this. I really hope you are getting this. This is some powerful revelation. Very, very powerful revelation. So as you can see, he said to them, and I will restore unto you, I will restore unto you the years that the locust has eaten away, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palm worm. These creatures again, all right? Now, let's look at another scripture here. Let's look at Revelation chapter 16. I use this all the time. Revelation chapter 16, and we're going to read from verse 13 to verse 14. Revelation 16, verse 13 to 14, because again, it's only going to solidify my point even more, only building more stronger pillars to this particular revelation that I'm giving you, that these spirits come in the form of animals, insects, they may come in the form of alien creatures in the dreams or even when I hear on the documentaries, National Geographic, and people say that they saw UFOs and aliens, I believe them. But what they're really saying is demonic forces. That's what it is, okay? Revelation chapter 16, okay? I'm going to build this some more. I'm going to read it verse 13. This is John now, the revelator. And John is having this vision. So he's fully conscious. He's fully awake. He's having this vision. Here's what he saw. And he said, I saw three unclean spirits. Okay, good. He's saying he saw three unclean spirits. So that means if they're spirits, they're invisible. They cannot be seen. But in this case, the Lord is allowing him to see. So when he said he saw three unclean spirits, basically what he's saying, that they're not visible to everybody else. He is able to see it because he's now receiving a revelation from the Lord. He's now given the ability to now peer into the unseen world. Okay, because God wanted him to see this. And I saw three unclean spirits. Well, watch what he's going to say now. He didn't say now they were one tall man and a short woman and a little midget. He didn't describe no humans here. Watch how he's going to describe these unclean spirits. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. Mm -hmm. Out of the mouth of the beast. Mm -hmm. Out of the mouth of the false prophet. Remember who he describes the dragon as? Satan, the serpent. Of course, the BC is the Antichrist and of the, of the false prophet. Verse 40 says, for they are the spirits. They are the spirits of who? Devils. So it's proving my point again. These spirits that look like frogs, he defined in verse 14 who they were. He says, for they are the spirits of devils. That's what he said. The frog that you saw in your dream, they are the spirits of devils. The alligator that you saw in your dream, the snake that you saw, the black panther, which is sorcery from me into the toy power, all evils. But what are they coming after? Your spiritual blessings. God has blessed you with all spiritual blessings. He blessed you with spiritual blessing of sanity, soundness of mind. But you saw the scorpion in the dream and the scorpion stung you in the dream. 
watch your life from that day forward if you never rebuke your dream. All of a sudden, you're tormented, you're easily frustrated, you're agitated, you're fearful. These are tormenting spirits. You saw this huge snake in the dream, obviously speaking of witchcraft, a cobra or some adder or whatever, speaking of witchcraft. But again, what did Jesus say? He says, behold, I've given you power to use my name to come against these invisible beings in the form of serpents. If you said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, if you're living right now, let's get that straight, you're living right. You're living right now. Make sure there's nothing in your life. Your life got to be clean. Using the authority of that name. If you want them to permanently leave, when you say leave, then you got to make sure you clean up on the inside. Always in a repentant state. Father, I, I might have sinned today. I don't know what I did. I might have harbor some nonsense in my mind and just discard it not knowing that it was a sin I repent right now in the name of Jesus Christ because I need to always be regaled and ready for when these devils come okay so we say in the name of Jesus Christ now you have the power to thread upon them because to thread means I have subdued them and I could walk over them to get to my destination I can't hold me up no more no no they cannot cannot do it at all now I want us to look at two other scriptures before I close this out. This is very powerful, very powerful, because what I'm going to do, and it's kind of like giving you a little nugget for how I'm going to conclude this in my last video. I'm going to show you how, what gives these creatures in the dream the authority to attack you. Kind of, kind of let the cat out of the bag just a little bit just now, but check this out. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 10 for me. I want to show you something very powerful here. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And let's look at verse 8. This is so deep. This is very deep. This is what it says here, right? This is so powerful. This is a powerful revelation. This is a serious nugget. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 8. It says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Okay, we know that. But watch this. And whoso breaketh and hedge a serpent shall bite him. Oh, boy, I wonder if I should go here. Wanna, you got time? The squeeze is in here. You got some time right here. You all get that? You all get that, right? Let's focus on part B of Ecclesiastes 10 and 8. Whoso breaketh a hedge, mm -hmm, a serpent shall bite him. That whole squeeze Peace right there is completely spiritual. Nothing physical about that. Absolutely nothing. And I'm about to prove it to you right now. He said, whoso breaketh a hedge, whoever breaks a hedge that's protecting them, a place, a environment, whatever, then the serpent is going to use that opportunity. And what is breaking this hedge in this particular case, in the spiritual things we're talking about, when someone violates the laws of God, when someone is living in sin or iniquity or transgression, unrepented state, then the hedge has now been tampered with. Really? What kind of hedge are you talking about? Is this a physical hedge? No, 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 no. I told you the whole spirit to me. I think that I just quoted there was spiritual, so we can prove this. Keep your finger here. We can come right back here, right? Because we want to deal with this hedge aspect. We know that the serpent, which represent the Satan or the devil, is spiritual because we have already cleared that up earlier. But let's look at this hedge word. So in order to understand that, let's go to Job. Let's go to Job. I hope you guys loving this. Because I love this. Chapter 1. All right, let's go to Job chapter 1. Okay. Now Job chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, all the way to verse 8, is God putting the limelight on Job. But God is having a conversation with Satan, who's invisible, the serpent, right? And he's telling him how Job is an upright man. He eschews evil. He repents for the sins of his children just in case they did evil and they didn't repent themselves, blah, blah, blah. You know, Job is his golden child, all right? Satan, in verse 9, says, it says, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Do Job fear God for naught? Or, God, you believe that Job fear you for nothing? Listen to verse 10. This is Satan speaking because that's how you're going to get the revelation. And remember, two spiritual beings, two invisible beings, are having a conversation about Job who's on the earth and he has no knowledge of this. Job, that is. All right? Now watch this. 10, verse 10 of Job 1. Satan is still speaking. He says, Has not thou made a hedge about him? Mm hmm. Who's speaking again? Satan. 
Mm -hmm. Satan is a spiritual being, right? Yes. God is spiritual too. Yeah, yeah, he is. But Satan in this particular verse 10 of Job 1 is revealing to the reader, not by intent, but through his discourse with God. He's revealing something spiritual that protects the people of God that we would have never known had the scripture had not been said. So Satan knows a spirit, looking in the spiritual realm as usual, but also looking at Job, the physical man, he sees something around Job invisibly or spiritually that the average human, not the average human, no human is able to see. So this is where he says now, he says, has not thou made, he's saying to God, have not you made a hedge about him? Didn't you put spiritual protection around him and you know that I cannot get through there? Listen to this now. Has not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that, that he had on every side? Thou hast blessed the works of his hand. And God is, boy, I love this. Every man and woman of God that has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I posted this couple of weeks, a couple of days ago. You are under divine protection, surveillance. The, 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 the God of Abraham has, is protecting you and watching with the only way the enemy can come at you. And we read it in uh, Ecclesiastes 10 and 8. It is when you break that hedge of protection, then the serpent come in to bite you. Read the scripture. It's not my opinion. It's not my feeling. It is exactly what the scripture says. This is what you call deep revelation. Now we're looking at things from a spiritual perspective. Whatever happens physically is the after effect of what has been done or not done in the spiritual realm. So these are the results of it right here. So again, whatever happens physically, we're dealing with an already baked cake. We cannot uh, undo the cake. It's already baked. Most you could do right now is destroy it. So isn't that powerful? Satan says the only reason why, okay, Job ain't, because you got a hedge of protection around him, around his house, around his everyone is protected because of Job's commitment to you. So now let's go back here with that said to Ecclesiastes. Let's look at Ecclesiastes again. Uh, verse chapter 10 and verse 8. He says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whosoever break it and hedge the serpent, the devil, that evil spirit in the form of a snake shall bite you. Why are they biting you in your dreams? The dream is showing you something far deeper than what you think. If that snake has the ability to bite you in the dream, then that means your spiritual protection has been tampered with. But the only way it can be tampered with is through you. What are you violating as it relates to the laws of God, the scriptural rules? What is it? Do you have unforgiveness in your heart? Because I always tell you, this is the number one ruler of sin in mankind. Mankind may say, I'm not drinking, I'm not smoking, I'm not having sex with other people's spouses, I'm not fornicating, I'm making positive declarations and so on. But no, you didn't mention the part about you didn't forgive your children, you didn't forgive your wife, you didn't forgive your husband. And because you believe that nobody could see that unforgiveness, you think you're cool with God. But here now comes the dream, and in the dream, whoop, the serpent bites you in the bit you in the dream. Why? Because your hedge have been tampered with, and according to the law of Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8b, it says clear, it says, if the hedge be broken, then the serpent will bite. The back the scripture, I'll be looking at our Proverbs 26 and 2. The curse causeless cannot come. There have to be a reason. There have to be a reason. And this is why I'm going to speak more on my, I'm going to do that today. But I have to give you a good scene. So I'm going to take it on the beach today because I know this thing is going to be very, very good because I've already fixed it. And I'm going to wrap up this little mini series on dreaming about animals and so on and dreaming what they mean. And I'm going to bring, I'm going to, I'm going to end with what I'm telling you right now. How the enemy have the ability to come in and to bite through your spiritual edge of protection only when you tamper with it, only when you put your hand to evil, whatever the case may be. That's the only way that it could happen. So uh, should I stop here? Let me see if I should stop right here. I think I have like about, I think I have like about five more minutes. Okay, here we go. Should I stop here? Yeah, I'm gonna stop right here. I'm gonna stop right here. And I'm just gonna pick up on the heels and conclude it this afternoon, okay? 
this again was supposed to be live, but I had to upload it because of all of the difficulties I was having with the internet. I thought it was corrected by now, but obviously that didn't happen. But I hope that this teaching was a blessing to you. And, and what I'm training you uh, overtly and even subliminally in my teachings, I'm always trying to get you to keep your view, your, your, your 